Good morning, everyone. Um, so here's my uh, kind of agenda for today's class um, and what I, what I have ambition for today. I actually want to start by checking in with the papers with everybody and seeing if there's any kind of general things that we can discuss. I've been on the phone with lots of people, and I think maybe if you've got some questions, like I've said before, it'd be useful for other people to hear about it as well, because um, they probably have similar things that they're wrestling with. This is a challenging project, and there's, there's some very natural things that come with the territory of writing a paper like this, regardless of which topic you're doing. Um, so I'd like to check in about the papers. <clears throat> I got one little last hanging thread with Cohen that I'd like to do. A very small little short argument at the very end of his paper. So we'll, we'll knock that out. And then we can start talking about multiculturalism and the Sarah Song article. Um, I'm actually curious to ask everyone in the chat how many people have read at least half of it. Read all of it. Awesome. Anthony, you can ask a question over the mic, too. Yeah, uh, in a second here. Read it all? Cool. Sweet. Three people have read it all. Don't be shy. Just I appreciate honesty, knowing kind of what we're dealing with here, what I'm working with. Okay. That's pretty close to the end. Okay. Anyone else want to chime in? I heard from five people. Thank you for sharing. It's okay. I'm not going to think in any better or worse of you or anything like that. I know it's busy. I'll, I'll let you know why I'm asking. Um, the multiculturalism article is not just one view, right? There's not just like laying out like Cohen. Cohen has a uh, the Cohen article is a good example of like I would want to lecture on this because he's got a, a one position. It's somewhat complicated. There's a lot of different arguments that are a part of bringing that idea into focus. The multiculturalism article instead is like a survey. It's like here are a bunch of different options and positions, and you get a little bit of the opening. Um, thank you. Uh, thanks for sharing, Naomi. Um, you get a, uh, a little bit of the sort of first order level arguments in it, um, but just kind of a introduction, right? Just a, a snapshot of what's going on. So it's useful for covering a wide swath of intellectual territory and different theoretical options. And I thought for a topic like multiculturalism, that would be kind of better to get a, get a sense of the opportunity for disagreement rather than just focusing on one voice in that conversation or one position in it. Um, but it also um, means I'm, I'm way more interested in hearing about um, what it sort of uh, provoked in all of you, like what, what you're thinking about with wrestling with this question and which ideas you're more drawn to that you are more sympathetic with. I, I actually think a lot of these positions are all making points that are fairly sympathetic, right? It's like this complex juggling balancing act of all these different morally relevant features to the question about how do we live as a as a, a community of people in a state of social cooperation like what sort of social cooperation should we have that addresses the fact of the diversity of our backgrounds and circumstances and cultures and worldviews um, what's the right way to deal with that um, so I'm kind of uh, I, you know, if we, if we were in person, this would be, uh, I would be very quick to go to our mode we were using before of breaking to small groups, having discussion, and then reporting. And that's a, that's not as viable <laughs> on this online format. Um, so I, I really do want to, when we, when we come to it today, kind of rely on you to participate. So I really hope that you do. Um, and don't be shy about sharing your ideas or, well, I can't, again, can't tell you how to feel, but um, I hope that you'll uh, 
throw out your ideas here, and we can um, unpack them and follow the threads of where your thoughts are at with this kind of thing. And maybe that you have some new things that you want to add in, like you didn't see, you've got some concerns or um, approaches or values that you didn't see get represented in any of those positions. That would be really cool, too, to make the conversation that richer. Um, all right, so, pardon me. Hmm. Hmm. Um, so that's the plan for today, and um, let's see how it goes. Um, so to start, I want to check in about the papers, see how it's going, um, what questions you have. Anthony, it sounds like you have a question. Um, if you want to use the mic, go for it. Very welcome to do that. You're okay on, on my end. Okay, so you're um, so those of you watching on YouTube later. You're, I don't think the the um, audio is coming through, so I, I want to repeat Anthony's question. And and actually, I want to clarify too, Anthony. So let me know if I'm I'm hearing you properly. So you're you're writing your paper on the topic of dignity, of human dignity, and how to have it reflected more robustly in society. Is that right? Okay, so specifically in relation to class. All right, and your question was, do you do you have to argue rhetorically? I heard you ask that question. What do you mean by um, do you have to argue rhetorically? Or the alternative that you presented was you can bring in ideas from other areas like economics. Can you help me understand what what you're thinking of with that choice between those two approaches? What what would it look like to argue rhetorically? Yeah. Okay, <clears throat> so the question is about um, how other sources of analysis or other theoretical frames that cover other sorts of dimensions, like you're thinking specifically economics here, that's a big one, okay, um, how that will influence your, your conversation. And, I mean, the quick answer is absolutely you can do that. Um, there's many cases in which there'd be no way getting around it, depending on what your controversy is set up as. Um, I mean, we've been getting into a lot of economics lately with Nozick, Rawls, and Cohen, but it's not like it's switching topics entirely from everything else we've been talking about in terms of social organization, <clears throat> which is what politics is about. And this is going to, if, if politics is about us living in society together and the ethical questions around that, a huge facet of that, of our lives together, is going to be in how the economy functions and how it's structured, right? So that could be absolutely relevant. At the same time, it could be a distraction too. Like if you, if your paper was really just uh, talking about, like you were saying, <clears throat> you're just sharing about how you want to explain the causes of some something or another happening, that would be a different type of theoretical project, like just explaining why things are working the way that they are in reality, 
um, is a different project than the one of political philosophy, or that we might say is about ethics, about normative matters. And I'm gonna I'm gonna take a little bit more time here to kind of unpack this because it, it's a little tricky. Um, it, it and I think maybe we talked about this at some point this quarter. Um, you remember me talking about the distinction between descriptive and normative claims? Yep, how things are, that's descriptive claims, versus how they ought to be, that's normative. And that's the world of ethics and morality. It's prescriptive. It's about what we ought to be doing. And if you've got a normative conclusion, which you're going to have to have because political philosophy is a normative ethical enterprise, so your conclusion, your thesis is going to have to be weighing in on some normative matter. Um, in the premises that you offer as arguments to support a normative conclusion, you can have descriptive components. Um, does it ring bells if people remember um, my example argument of normative conclusion, don't hit people? Why? Because hitting causes pain. Does that ring bells? Right? So knowing that hitting causes pain is a descriptive claim about just how the world works, that could be extremely relevant for whether or not you should hit people, right? <laughs> like knowing what the consequences are going to be uh, is going to be relevant. But that fact doesn't speak for the moral conclusion all by itself. It's dependent on another normative premise, maybe even an unspoken or assumed premise, that causing pain is wrong, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's important that the distraction that we don't get distracted onto just the quibbling over the empirical stuff. This showed up in the Sarah Song article. There's a question about whether there's um, an empirical dynamic that is a circumstantial descriptive one, uh, a causal one, about whether emphasizing issues of multiculturalism distracts from issues of class, right, of economic disparity. Um, that was one criticism of, of the multiculturalism project or the politics of recognition. And the response uh, by some of the multiculturalists has been, uh, we should do some more empirical research to see if that's really the case. Because if that is the case, then we have a really tough ethical choice to make about which one of these things is more important or which one are we maybe going to deprioritize in order to deal with the justice of the other one. I mean, that could be... If, if we have to make that choice, that's going to be tricky. But maybe we don't even have to, right? Maybe that actually there isn't a tension between those two things, and emphasizing one doesn't mean deprioritizing that. We can have our cake and eat it too. Mm -hmm. that, that's, a, that's a way in which empirical research could be majorly relevant to a project. But this is not a project that you're in a position to be able to do very well for this assignment. Um, and I don't want you focusing on that. I mean, if you're doing a bigger project, like let's say you're doing a thesis dissertation for a PhD program, and you've got arguments that depend on claims that have to be empirically correct about how the world works, then you definitely would want to do your due diligence on trying to back those things up and, and investigate that and do that research. My advice for this paper is try to focus your discussion on the ethical kinds of premises rather than the descriptive ones. Because that's, I want you to have some practice with ethical argumentation and ethical debate. A lot of times, uh, in my experience, observing people, that when we get to ethical matters, we'd much rather debate the facts. Because approving facts is a much more straightforward enterprise. Even if they're disputable or controversial, we know how to kind of pursue knowledge in that regard, right? We know how to find evidence to support that, and it's, it's a little more... The path is like marked out, right, about how we're going to resolve this disagreement. And we just have to do more investigation and observations and analyze the data, and we'll, we'll come to a better conclusion. But when it comes to the ethical disputes, that is much harder. So when my students are writing ethics papers for me, um, I see that same temptation. They're like, I don't know how to do the ethical debate, so I'll do this other thing that I feel much more confident and familiar about. Right, the, to do the empirical research stuff. And I actually want you to, to struggle with the ethical stuff. That's the deeper sort of disagreements. Here's one strategy that you can use in your paper, though, if you're feeling that pull of the relevance of some empirical stuff. One, you can just use thought experiments. So you can do things like, let's say that this is the case. Let's just grant for the sake of argument this, I'm right, that this empirical premise holds. 
Okay, I'm not going to go on to do the whole story of defending it, but let's just say that it's true. Here's what I argue that would mean. Here's what I think should be the ethical response if the world works like this. And then you can also, secondly, be like, what if I'm wrong about that empirical premise? What if my opponents are right about this? Then what do I think that means? And that's a lot of what ethics is doing. It's not trying to give recommendations with a narrow scope of just here th this one situation. We're curious about, well, what would be the right thing if it was like this, or like this, or like this, a whole range of cases, and trying to understand how the ethical response to all those cases could be consistent, that it wouldn't be arbitrary, or ad hoc, or have double standards, or things like that. And that's useful for even understanding the one particular case that you might be focused on, to understand, like, what are the general principles that justify a response in this particular case. So. It, does this is this making sense to you, Anthony? Is this helpful? Yeah. Uh, totally fair. Yeah, we yeah, we can absolutely talk about it. Some of this stuff is tricky, but um, the general advice of of where I would like you to be focusing your analytical and argumentative efforts is that coming through? Okay, people in chat, is this making sense to you too? Yeah? Cool. Jaden, you're in you're in uh, political philosophy this morning, huh? Hello. <laughs> you're very welcome. You, I'm not kicking you out. If you want to stick around, that's totally okay. I had the basis of that thought experiment. I just thought it was more empirical, I guess. Huh. Hmm. Um, Another thing I wanted to say is, I, I don't, like, I was kind of curious what you meant by rhetorical arguing. I would definitely be resistant to associate rhetorical arguing with ethical arguing. Um, <clears throat> making appeals to moral principles and values is not a rhetorical device. Um, it's not, it's not pure pathos or something like that in terms of an argumentative style. We can, <clears throat> we can create theories about this stuff and give rational arguments for, for why one set of values is the ones we ought to be operating with versus some other. Uh, it's not purely an appeal to just intuition or people's um, gut reactions to things like eliciting an emotional response that makes them more sympathetic with your side. That's cool, Jaden. I'm sorry it's been laggy for you. Anything else about that? Um, I, Anthony, I think I'm happy you brought up this question. I think this will be relevant for not just your paper, but perhaps many other papers. Um, is there anything kind of else in this area that you're wondering about? So I guess my the TLDR here was you can absolutely use um, ideas and research from other directions. Um, they can be integrated into the project, but make sure that's the role that they're playing rather than kind of taking it over. It's still, the focus here is about... Uh, resolving ethical disagreement. That was a huge boulder in the road for you. Thank you. You're welcome. I'd be very happy if, if my comments here actually uh, cleared away that boulder entirely. That'd be great. It's, it's tricky. It's a tricky uh, call to make about how to navigate that. How's everyone else doing with the papers? What other stuff is, is kind of coming up for you? Papers are kind of top priority right now in terms of our class for me, uh, probably for you too. But because it's for you, I, I'm thinking it's it's a good priority here too. Good for us to use space on it. How, how's everyone else doing? Stuck on the outline. Um, so an outline was uh, recommended um, and, and not required. Uh, but it is highly recommended, just as a way to kind of get all your ideas out, the arguments that you want to discuss in your paper, to kind of lay them all out on the table, so you can you can kind of step back and take stock of all of it, 
and then decide when you're writing your paper what order you want to discuss them in or um, how they might relate to each other, like which ideas, maybe arguments and objections kind of go together that you can, you know, so, sort of drag up a bunch of threads of conversation and talk about them in a sort of integrated way. Um, really helps for or just organizing your thoughts. Um, is there a part of doing the outline sort of step, Allison, that, that is the part that you're, that you're getting stuck with? <laughs> Excited for someone to read it and prove me wrong. <laughs> yeah, I'm happy that that's a, something attractive to you, Mark. Um, so Allison says, yeah, that's what I'm trying to do, but having trouble coming up with ideas. Okay, um, you have a thesis position. Do you kind of know where you stand on the debate? Like maybe a, an intuitive sympathy one way or the other? Um, Jaden, you're you're in my 115 class, right? This is the Jaden from my 115 class. Yeah, okay, you're just you're just hanging out for fun. Okay, um, I, I'm I'm not going to pursue your question. Uh, what about morality in terms of religion? It's hard for me to talk about morality without a standard behind it. Um, I'm not going to pursue that tangent right here. Um, but if you and I want um, want to talk about this outside of class, I would be very very happy to do it. Um, religion doesn't necessarily provide uh, some kind of alternative in terms of wondering about a basis for morality. Um, yeah. Um, okay, so Allison says, somewhat still trying to figure it out. Okay. Um, whether you, so in the writing guide I sent out, I described kind of two paths about how papers can get developed. One in which you kind of already know what your thesis is, another in which you don't. In either case, the real core thing is about being able to frame frame up um, the controversy itself, like why there's there a need for someone to write a paper about this, like why what provokes um, disagreement here, that uh, it's sort of under how to understand the puzzle before giving an answer. So the arguments that could either be your arguments in defense of your thesis or the arguments on your opponent's side, um, either way those arguments end up sort of defining why there's a, a space of disagreement. Because it's not just about what you believe, it's about why you believe it. Um, so as we uh, take the, the Sarah Song article on multiculturalism, you've got um, all these different positions, and the way that she writes the article as like a summary of like, here's what's going on with this topic, is not to restrict it to just the answers, the what's, but also the why's. Like, what are all those different positions sensitive to morally? What are the morally relevant features that they see that they're that pop out to them? And it's how all those values stack up against each other in a way in which we might independently be like, yeah, that's a great value. That's a great value. That's a great value. These things are all good things. But then there's circumstances in which they're sort of in tension with each other, or doing one means not doing the other, or being responsive to one limits your ability to be responsive to another. So now we're in this tension. Now we've got a disagreement. Now we've got a rational controversy, and we need some maybe deeper thinking, some more root critical reflection on which of these things should be given priority, like which one should be the, the one we're, that's going to inform what course of action we're going to take. Um, so my advice on on kind of uh, fleshing out your discussion is to always treat as the number one priority here just framing up like wh what is the problem? Why is there a problem? Um, rather than jumping to necessarily just how do I defend my thesis and how do I find arguments against it? Um, just think about the, the question itself and honoring the the question and what makes it tricky. If you understand what the problem is, um, you're, you're, that will make the rest of the paper flow a lot more easily in terms of the, just the brainstorming and everything. If you've got a good sense for why there's a difficulty in the first place, that can really help. Now that doesn't solve everything. It does, it's not like it will necessarily be totally trivial after you've got that framed up. Um, but that would, that's always my first like line of, of advice about it. 
Um, I don't know, is that helping at all, Allison? I mean, we're going to talk later today, too, but... Um, yeah, okay, okay. Treating that your your job in, an, in a philosophy paper is not quite like an argumentative paper or a persuasive essay. The point is not to convince your audience that you're right. The point of it is to resolve an area of stickiness of rational disagreement and controversy. So if, if you're not doing justice to the problem itself, then the answer is not going to be very robust or helpful, right? That's another reason why having charity for your opponent and really trying to, once you have a position down and you've got some arguments, that you're entertaining ways in which you're trying to anticipate how could someone be like, I, I don't buy this argument. This doesn't make sense. This is based on false premises. It's bad reasoning. You know, this kind of stuff. Um, Naomi says, I'm writing about retributive justice versus restorative justice. And as I researched about them, I noticed that Christianity is involved in both of them. Is it okay if I use religious moral responses to support part of my paper? That's a very interesting question, Naomi. Um, I would say it depends on what you want to do. So it's a, this is an it depends kind of answer, but like I always say, it depends is an easy answer until you say depends on what. So let me explain what I think it depends on. I think the main thing is just what fish you want to fry. So are there ways to talk about retributive versus restorative justice that do not require baggage from religion or a Christian worldview or something like that? Absolutely. Plenty of secular people, people who have no relationship with any religion or people who are religious that don't have commitments to Christianity, one way or the other, right, for or against, um, can have this same rational disagreement. In other words, to, to frame up the problem does not require it. However, if you wanted to look at it through that lens of like, what does Christianity have to offer uh, to this, d this debate about retributive versus restorative justice, um, that could be a fine paper. But then you'd, you'd definitely be narrowing the focus a little bit um, in terms of not just this issue, but this issue juxtaposed with, you know, what does Christianity offer? Like maybe what, what would a, what a, what would a, um, what should a Christian think about retributive versus restorative justice? And then you're doing a kind of theological slash moral project. I'd be fine with that. Theology is philosophy. It, it's a little bit more restrictive, but having focus to your paper is something all of you have to do. I mean, you can't necessarily bite off into the entirety of, of these big topics that generate a lot of the controversies. Um, so having focus is fine doing something that is more narrowly defined is okay, and to do it if in theological terms is okay too. I might want to talk to you about some of the specifics with that, Naomi, but um, it's definitely a, a route that you can take. Does that answer your question, or at least for right now? Cool. Um, there's a little tangent I, I kind of like to go on on this topic too. Like, which is, um, you know, I remember back when I was a younger student, I was much, um, I was really involved with, say, literature and lit crit um, before I got into philosophy. I, humanities have always been a part of my education, a pretty strong part of my education, um, all the way from when I was homeschooled. And I remember in lit crit, you do a lot of like, oh, like l loose association, like this idea is similar to this idea, so there's a connection here, and the author's maybe trying to suggest, and like, what are they saying about that? And it's a lot about tracking just how ideas get associated with each other. Philosophy wants something a little more rigorous than just that. So the fact that these two ideas are related, it's always useful to ask, how are they related? Especially like in the response I just gave about Christianity in the context of retributive versus restorative justice um, is like, is this a necessary connection? Or is this just incidental, right? That, yeah, there is a way in which Christianity is conversant with these moral ideas, but it's not like it's necessary to have, those ideas don't aren't necessarily associated, right? So there's other ways in which we could, the same pattern of thinking can emerge in religious and secular contexts. I mean, that kind of uh, more careful um, analysis about if these things are connected, how are they connected, is is a big part of of kind of I don't want to sound highfalutin about this, but um, 
intellectual discipline or, or rigor or something in terms of being a critical thinker um, and not just like, oh, these ideas go together and these ideas go together. Um, it's always useful to think about how necessary is it. I've been uh, sort of talking about this with uh, Cohen, the Cohen article. Um, he's defending communism. And a lot of people think of communism, they think of Stalinism. They think of Stalinist Russia, USSR. Um, and those things have become very closely associated with one another, um, but they probably shouldn't be. Um, to paint one with the brush of the other, is there a connection between them? Well, yeah, Stalinism came out of Marxist theory for sure. Is it the only way that that could manifest? Absolutely not, right? Um, so maybe that, that helps a little bit uh, with for, for you, Naomi. It's also useful for thinking of where objections can come from and engaging with your opponent. Okay, um, we spent a bunch of time here talking about the paper. I think it's really good, good use of time. Um, anyone else want to get some questions in here before I keep going? If you do, drop them in the chat. And uh, but let's keep moving here. So, what was this one thread? Uh, it's the next part of my agenda for today. What was this one thread from uh, Cohen that I wanted to discuss? So remember we were talking about how um, Cohen wants to argue socialism slash communism, basically systems of communal ownership or shared ownership instead of private ownership, more like public ownership, is uh, providing freedom, opportunities of freedom to people and of the same type that capitalism offers, but maybe more of it, that there's special opportunities here. Um, and you remember he was talking about, uh, one, how full freedoms can be outweighed by a sufficient number of partial freedoms, like if you have to choose between the two, I might have this narrow range of, range of full freedom things that I own versus a wide range of things I have partial ownership of that give me opportunity for engaging with more things or more opportunities, but but in an incomplete way, right? I, I don't have complete domination over those spaces. Um, so that, that fact that partial freedoms can outweigh full freedoms, that this can happen, and the concern about how under capitalism we may misunderstand what kind of freedom actually matters, that it's not a, like the hoarder conception of freedom, like domination over physical objects, this kind of materialism um, that... that um, Cohen just thinks this is this isn't what it means to value freedom. That kind of freedom is not that important. Um, I think this little quote is is helpful. Life under capitalism tends to generate an irrationally strong attachment to purely private use of purely private property, which can lead to neglect of mutually gainful and freedom expanding options. And that's something, right? That's uh, that is a um, an angle here that if we're trying to give a critical evaluation of really testing the connection, like I was just saying a second ago, of the association of capitalism with promoting the moral value on freedom and self-determination, that really challenges how tight that connection is going to be. And if there are not other ways that maybe we can do it better. Um, and that things like even straight up communism might actually be able to provide more freedom. But one way that the capitalist could respond to the sort of the limitations on freedom that are required under capitalism. Like remember before we said, if you give someone property ownership, then everyone else doesn't have freedom with respect to that thing. That maybe mar the market helps save the day. The, the, the way that we can contract um, helps to expand how much freedom you can have under capitalism. Because let's say I just own these things, and I, so I don't have access to all these other things. Well, I can gain access through the market. I can trade some of the things I have to be able to get those other kinds of opportunities. Um, take a, uh, um, so again, board game hobby, right? I buy a board game, and I play it, and it's fun, and then I'm kind of like, you know, I'm done with this game. I'll put it on the marketplace, because there, there's like an online community for this, and people, there's a special market on the website I go to a lot, where people just put up their games, their used games for sale cheap. Um, and so I can sell it and then use that to maybe buy a used game from somebody else, right? I'm like, I don't care to have domination over this game anymore because I don't, I'm not interested in exercising my freedom with respect to it. So instead of just being attached and hoarding 
all these games, although I have lots of games in my library, <laughs> um, I could trade it to gain access to some game I don't have access to right now and enjoy the benefit of that. So contracts help me extend what things I'm able to gain access to that I have freedom, the ability to act with respect to. Um, so we don't need socialism to gain these benefit, the argument goes, we don't need socialism or communism to expand the getting this benefit of access to things that I don't currently have ownership of, that the partial ownership. I can use the market to expand my options. And I think um, Cohen has an interesting response to this. Um, and I'm just going to do this kind of quickly just to get it get it out there. I, I didn't, I didn't want to leave this one behind. Cohen sort of says um, that may work in situations, certain situations, that might be totally acceptable. But he thinks it, it requires premising positions where the two parties um, who are negotiating here can negotiate for mutual benefit. And that's the kind of thing, I don't know, how many of you have, have read any Adam Smith? Familiar with Adam Smith? Classical, kind of a liberal defense of capitalism kind of thing. I mean, it's really, um, Adam Smith's defense of capitalism is extremely influential, and so much so that sometimes it gets applied into cases that it doesn't actually apply into, uh, that the circumstances under which he's thinking about and evaluating, oh, awesome, Hayden, cool, evaluating the moral merits of a free market uh, are under very idealized circumstances. I mean, they're theoretical circumstances, and they definitely, if for my money, they don't factor in um, inequality of power. They really premise a kind of like a thought experiment of like we're all equal, and no one's got a huge leg up on anybody else. And if we allow for as much interaction as possible between people, then we're able to get market efficiencies. We're able to take the existing resources that are in our world and distribute them in a way where we get the biggest bang for our buck. Like people, we sort of maximize happiness this way, right? Um, and so that would be really, really cool. To, we should absolutely do this. Uh, it's a great, the market, you don't have to micromanage the distribution of resources. Um, this, is, this is what uh, Adam Smith calls the invisible hand. If you've ever heard the invisible hand argument, that if everyone is just operating in a free market, even if they are selfish and self-interested, everyone is actually going to benefit. And modern economists are not drinking this Kool-Aid anymore. I mean, they're just like, this isn't what happens. Um, and a lot of that has to do with having the free market system happen in cases of deep inequality, where if two people are equals, relatively speaking, then when they're going to trade, no one's got another person over the barrel. And they're going to have to make more concessions in that negotiation to result in a scenario that really is truly mutually beneficial. Unlike the kind of situation that I was describing throughout this whole last week or so about the me owning the factory and having the jobs and you needing jobs and this sort of thing. Um, so um, this, is, this is the thing that Marxists are deeply concerned about, that we started this whole discussion with Cohen about, about coercion. Um, how, how consensual agreements are not necessarily truly free when they have, or the, the, the freedom might be there, but the value of it might be compromised because of the coercion, coercion that is involved. So if, again, if you don't have the means for participating in that free market, and you don't have enough means to kind of make yourself into an equal participant with other people, then you, the, the market is not going to be as uh, effective in opening up other opportunities for you as it is sort of on paper or theoretically. So Jaden says, but no market means no negotiation and no chance to trade. Um, I mean, this depends um, about how extreme of a system we're talking about. Uh, I mentioned before that communism versus capitalism is not an all or nothing enterprise. We do not have full free market capitalism right now. It it's definitely has socialist elements in there and regulations and most capitalists, uh, even a lot of libertarians, are going to go for some kind of regulation involved. And even under communism, a lot of versions of it doesn't mean um, everything works this way. Like we were joking earlier that it's not like we all need to share the shirt I'm wearing or something like that. Um, okay, so um, we can kind of decide where that line is drawn. But there might be... Um, we were talking about this theme yesterday of like what things should be 
up for participation in the market about. And we might be able to say some things, like maybe this little board game community. Yeah, board games, that's fine. We have a market space for board games, that's cool. Even if it's just a barter system, like, hey, I'll give you this game and you can give me this game, we trade them around, we're sharing, right, more or less, uh, mediated through a kind of market. That could be cool. Even a Marxist could be cool with that. They would just be like, let's make sure the means of production isn't being handled on a market, that that shouldn't happen. Or I, I think I, the code word yesterday, I did a post-scarcity. It's like, should livelihood be linked with employment? Should it be a, a market thing? Like, you need to participate in the market in order to have your livelihood. Universal basic income is kind of a compromise on that. Um, it's a way of, of sort of saying, yeah, we're going to use a market sort of like a tool to allow people to acquire the resources needed for their livelihood, but we're not going to make it all dependent on the person to come up with to, to position themselves in a place where they're able to leverage influence and have agency in that market. Capitalist anarchy has never worked. Even most conservatives will agree with that. Absolutely, Hayden. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe I'll just leave you with this. I mean, I'm, if people want to discuss this more. Oh, right, we've only got like five minutes left, so I did not get to my whole agenda here. To, I really want to talk about multiculturalism, too. Um, but it's okay. Um, um, for my money, I'll just let you know where I'm at. The question of whether there is a ethically just version of capitalism that's possible is sort of something I'm, I think the jury's out on. I think what is currently happening is clearly not just, I should turn my hat for this, I think what's currently happening, the current state of affairs is not just or ethical. The version of capitalism that's running is, is, is not doing that. It's not accomplishing that. It's not, it's not like everything is fine. It isn't. But is there some way to fix it? Can capitalism be fixed to make it just? Maybe. There also, this would take a much deeper type of uh, dive, analytic dive in this, but there also could be reasons to worry that the, the, the whole arrangement, the whole um, form of it is not going to be fixable. That's Marx's view. Marx describes capitalism as a sick patient who you can try to stretch out their life a little longer, but the inevitable is going to happen. This is not a sustainable solution for a just society. Um, and, and the moves of like little bits of socialism and stuff like that, or democracy, help it last longer, but um, it's, not, it's not going to be tenable in the long run. So Marx has a pretty fatalistic view of it. He's like, the revolution is just sort of euthanizing the sick patient. <laughs> That's his like view on it. Um, and there's other people who are like a, a lot of some of the um, so-called um, altruistic uh, capitalists or entrepreneurs in today's world are sort of like, yeah, ca we can make capitalism work for justice. Um, and so there's some enthusiasm about that. There's also maybe some misguided enthusiasm about that, about maybe not taking the problem as seriously as it needs to be. But this is a this is a major debate. It's a big thing to consider, and we just scratched the surface on it. Um, Anthony asks, are we going to have a lecture on Monday? You bet. There's uh, assigned classes, so multiculturalism is going to happen there for sure. And I'm thinking I'm, I'm going to be offering an extra credit session during our finals period next week. Um, and uh, I think we might be using it for multiculturalism because I, I don't want to, I, I want us to treat this issue right and we haven't been able to get to it today. So if we just had one hour on Monday for it, not enough. So maybe we can talk about that during our finals period too. And I'll, um, I'll be giving you the update about that this weekend. Okay, Jaden says, uh, oh, before I forget, um, Code word for today is cherry blossoms. Code word for today is cherry blossoms. Okay, Jaden says, but the chance at working towards something that can be freedom is a type of freedom itself, right? For an example, if you have seen the Will Smith movie Pursuit of Happiness, it talks about happiness not coming from freedom, but the pursuit of it. Because um, socialism and communism gives people no reason to try and pursue work. A um, couple things going on with this. One, um, there could be, uh, if the way, uh, maybe you missed, uh, I don't think you were here for some of these other Cohen lectures, but the way we're defining freedom for the purposes of, <laughs> uh, for this discussion is um, ability to act. So 
uh, if you're leveraging your ability to act to expand your ability to act, then there is freedom in that. Um, but it also would be false to say uh, that means you have total freedom or that there isn't a difference in what kind of freedom is available. I mean, if you wanted to talk about freedom in this sort of way, you would say, well, slavery is freedom. I guess it's meaningful. What's the problem with it? We'd be like, no, there's still a problem with slavery, right? <laughs> so that would that's, that's one point that I, I think is relevant here. The other one is that um, under communism or socialism, uh, I think this is, this is, I should turn my hat to this. I think this is a really common argument that gets thrown around that unless there was capitalism, people wouldn't have any motivation to better themselves or to develop themselves or like that you need the competition of the marketplace and you need basically to use people's livelihood as a sort of Damocles hanging over their head to get them off their asses and not be lazy good for nothings. Um, I hear that argument a lot and in this context of this conversation. And I think it's really suspect um, that as if there are no other motivations that cause people to want to invest in the world, invest in each other, pursue innovation, um, participate with meaningful projects. Um, if I wasn't getting paid to do this job and I was getting universal basic income, I absolutely would still do it. I mean, it's kind of not financially prudent for me to even be taking the job that I'm having right now. Like, it's, I don't have any financial future working as a teacher, but I do it because I, one, very authentically and sincerely care about you, peop you people, you individual, individually, each of you, and the other pe each individual I'm going to have the opportunity to work with in the future as I keep teaching. And... Um, I think this stuff is meaningful, and to participate with it and have a relationship with it is satisfying on its own, intrinsically, regardless of a instrumental or extrinsic motive of money being involved. I am not thinking about dollar signs when I'm grading your papers or looking at your faces when we had class together or something like that earlier this quarter. Um, that's not the, the main thing that drives my participation forward. And I don't think it's the main motive that drives most people's participation forward. Even money itself is just a vehicle for getting something else. Um, and those are the things that we really pursue. And we would still pursue them even if it didn't have money as the mediator for it. Or so I would argue. There's an awesome Star Trek episode about this, by the way, um, where uh, it was a TNG episode where there's a cryo satellite with a bunch of 21st century humans that have been frozen because they have diseases that can't be cured. And then in the 24th century, they find them and unfreeze them. And, and then there's a big conversation. And one of the guys is like a Goldman Sachs CEO, um, like big hedge fund manager person. And he can't understand the Star Trek universe in which there is no money. And people don't have jobs that, that work for their livelihood. And he thinks of it as a dystopian um, and there's a great speech by Picard. I may I could find if you were curious sometime about how he's like, uh, humanity has gone beyond needing to like motivate its participation and investment in them in bettering ourselves and working towards each other's benefit through purely self-interested metrics or mechanisms. Um, Sam says, is the advancement of a collective not something to work for, and could it not just be as motivating as self-advancement? Maybe even more fulfilling. And that's kind of what I'm I'm thinking here too. Um, okay, it's 1021, so we are we are uh, officially um, class dismissed. But any any last parting shots you want to throw in there? When we get into our session today. I definitely want to, I'll be trying to uh, stay on the phone with everyone today as much as possible for last minute discussions about papers. Please don't hesitate to look me up and I appreciate your patience uh, as I maybe I'm on the phone with, with other people too. Um, but I, I want to talk to all of you as much as possible. Um, good luck with your papers. I'm very excited to read them. I know that this is a tough project and I want you to know that I know that. Um, and I am looking again mostly for your um, just participation in taking a crack at doing something ambitious, um, that kind of ambitious modesty or modest ambition kind of thing, if you remember from me talking about that before. Um, go for it. Take a shot. Make, use the checklist, uh, the instructions and grading document that I gave you. Uh, I've, I think um, 
that has been helpful for some other students I've been talking with one-on-one -on -one is just a reminder of what you're here to do in the paper and how you're accountable. Um, so hope that helps. Okay. Have a good weekend, everyone. Good luck finishing things up, and I'm here for you. Let me know how I can help.